Welcome to Winchester College. My name is Adam Rattray. I'm a teacher here. I'm responsible for the teaching of art history here at Winchester. And I'm standing this morning in front of a plaque to George Mallory, a student here between 1900 and 1904. His name is probably familiar to you. Mallory was involved in three expeditions on Everest and in 1924 would die on its topmost slopes. Some believe he might even have summited. All we can be certain of is that Mallory and his climbing partner Sandy Irving were lost to human sight between heaven and earth while attempting to reach the summit of Mount Everest, 8th of June, 1924. To the glory of God and in proud memory of George Herbert Lye Mallory, scholar of this college and a founding member and president of a group called the Winchester Ice Club. Mallory's climbing style has been described as balletic. He moved very rapidly up seemingly impossible slopes. His sister, Avi, described how, uh, as a boy, it was useless telling Mallory that a tree could not be climbed because he would immediately attempt it. We have here a compass which was given in the belief that it was the compass that Mallory had on Everest in 1924. Here at Winchester, Mallory climbed all over the roofs and towers of the college. He famously free climbed Chapel Tower, using drain pipes and gargoyles as toeholds. Today, health and safety would not allow me to attempt that, so I'm going to use staircases. We have two aims for this film. The first is to show you Winchester from the rooftops and towers that Mallory would have known. And our second is to show you hidden Winchester, parts of the college that are not open to tourists and that indeed some boys and staff have not seen. We have permission to go everywhere. Our cameras will go into buildings ranging from the library to the former warden's lodgings. Winchester College, founded in 1382, is a national monument. There are no fewer than 18 Grade 1 buildings, 6 Grade 2 star, 70 of Grade 2. So let us make our way to the entrance, stopping at the heart of the medieval school. So this is the school that William built, uh, William of Wickham that is. William was born into a humble family in around about 1320 and he went to the grammar school here in Winchester. On leaving school he entered the church where he did well, uh, rising to become first Bishop of Winchester and then for two terms Lord Chancellor, the King's principal advisor. William knew the value of a good education and he established a college here in Winchester and also one in Oxford, now known as New College. And boys would transfer from Winchester College to New College as and when places at their Oxford sister became available. The scale of the two colleges was palatial and it was an extraordinary achievement even for a man like William of Wickham, Lord Chancellor and a man of whom the medieval chronicler Froissart said Everything in England was done by his consent and nothing was done without it. Let us now go to the entrance of Winchester College. We're standing here outside Outer Gate, built as the entrance to the college in the 1390s. It's uh, lower than originally intended um, because as they started to build it, the gate started to subside, the ground here being very wet and marshy due to the nearby river and its tributaries. The stone from which it's built is uh, mostly from the Isle of Wight, Bembridge Firestone and uh, Green Ventnor. The flints, however, are vernacular and local and when it rains they uh, glisten giving rise to the name 
Hampshire diamonds. It looks formidably secure and uh, Wickham might have had in mind uh, the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 when constructing it. While we're here, we can just see the, one of the college's great uh, treasures, the 1390s Virgin and Child, because Winchester College is actually the College of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Winchester, near Winchester. So let us go in now into her college again, under her gaze, through her gateway, and meet Alan, head porter here for many years. There is very little that Alan doesn't know about the college. Good morning, Alan. Good morning and welcome to Winchester College. Thank you. Now, the statutes of 1400 carefully set out the duties of the porter, and one of those duties was to cut the boy's hair. I don't know what your, your hairdressing skills are like, but I know that today you have a very important job to do. Yes, yeah, so we're going to raise the warden's flag. Um, we, we do this when the warden is in residence, a bit like the Queen, and it signifies to the college community that the warden is, is in fact in residence. Thank you. Well, if we could follow you in doing that, that would be yes, wonderful. Yes, of course, by all means. This is our first rooftop view of Winchester and we have here views not only of the college but also of the city beyond. Over there is the great bulk of the cathedral, a rich mix of architectural styles from Norman to early 16th century perpendicular Gothic. And there, that length of building, is the former college brewery where until 1903 beer was brewed for the boys and the staff. It was weak beer and it was better for them than water which was often polluted. Beer was served to the boys until 1916. Today no beer is served and the brewery itself has been converted into a library. The conversion in the 1930s by Sir Herbert Baker created one of the great architectural glories of the college. The clock at the end is called an empire clock, so called because of the symbols which represent the various countries of the empire, an empire on which the sun never set. The courtyard behind me is known as outer court and it was once busy with all the working buildings of the college needed to feed and provide for the boys. To my right was a granary, uh, beyond that uh, a laundry, possibly even a mill, uh, whereas to my left was the warden's stables, uh, a, a slaughterhouse where they uh, cu uh, cut and prepared meat until the late 1690s, and just behind me the original warden's lodgings. Until the late 16th century, the wardens lived in uh, above Middlegate in two chambers, and they lived for much of the college's life in great splendour. In 1629, the warden received two sheep a week, a hundred oysters every Friday, and no less than 15 gallons of beer every day. The warden plays a role rather different to that of the headmaster. Uh, he's responsible for the entire community. But let us now explore where Mallory and his fellow pupils studied, lived and ate. So we're now in College Hall, the dining hall of the school since the 1390s. And boys uh, today still eat in the way that boys in the past ate, of square wooden blocks known as trenches, uh, giving rise to the expression, a square meal. Mercifully, the food has improved recently, 
and is no longer as it was uh, for many generations when it was notoriously bad. And boys gave different nicknames to the meals that they were served. Long despair, cat's head, fat flab, rack, all equally disgusting. The room itself is magnificent and is very much as William of Wickham left it. The uh, windows on both sides allow light to come from north and south. The panelling, William of Wickham would not have known. This panelling dates to the 1540s. And originally, there was a fire in the centre of the room and the smoke left through a louvred chamber uh, right in the top of the ceiling. They still, at the end of a meal, boys, stand on the tables to exit hall. And let me show you how they do that. So follow me up now to Middlegate Tower. This is a room that few people visit. When Mallory was here, it was the college tutor's flat, and so he would have come here often. But it was originally built for the warden of Winchester College as part of his chambers, so he could keep an eye on the comings and goings of the college. It later became a place where the warden of New College in Oxford would annually visit to test the scholars of Winchester College to see if they were ready to go on to Oxford. After the First World War, a war in which Mallory served as a lieutenant in the Royal Artillery, this room was converted into a library and the sacrifice of his generation of scholars was made clear in this inscription here. It reads, Since the 58 scholars whose names you read here, having been brought up within this house to godliness and good learning, in the war waged for a period of five years from the year 1914, consecrated by their deaths, some the strength of manhood, other the flower of boyhood, willingly offered to God and their country. It is your duty, O you heirs of such great glory, now on the very threshold of life, with God providing the arms, reverently to gird yourselves for a similar struggle, whether in peace or in war. Physically, Mallory would survive the war, but mentally he was scarred by it, as indeed were so many of his contemporaries. Over 500 Wickhamists died between 1914 and 1918, an appalling total at a time when the school's population was roughly 450 boys. This splendid room, now a library, was once the warden's bedroom, and it was from here that he kept an eye on what was happening over the working area of college and also in the school. I think that the views here are some of the finest in college, but we are going even higher. The experiment of hall and chapel arranged side by side, made at Oxford, was here perfected at Winchester. And what we're looking at is a very fine example of perpendicular architecture, always recognizable because of the parallel lines of stone mullions which go vertically upwards towards the apex of the arch. It is a uniquely English style. So let's now go down across chamber court and into chapel. Now, much has changed in the chapel at Winchester College over the last 600 years, but not the proportions and not the magnificent Stella Leone wooden vault. That is exactly how it was when it was designed in the 1380s, early 1390s, and put together by medieval 
master craftsman headed by a man called Hugh Herland, who is the king's own carpenter. The glass is much stronger, is much brighter than it was originally. And this is because in the early 1820s, it was entirely replaced um, by substitutes. It has not always found favor. Kenneth Clark, the great art historian, uh, and an old Wickhamist, described the figures you see there as green and purple monsters. The great east window, which you see over there, again of the 1820s, shows right in the center the Virgin and Child. It's a Tree of Jesse window, but her prominence is notable because remember, this college was founded in her memory and to her adoration. Indeed, there's a wonderful simplified portrait of William of Wickham kneeling in adoration before the Virgin and Child in the bottom right. Another feature I like of this chapel is the fact that the corbels are in the forms of bishops and kings, and they support the ribs, which reach out towards the ceiling. The Victorians made their, or left their mark here in the form of the stone reredos behind the altar, but much of the panelling, which you see, and the pews are Edwardian or were carved just before the First World War. But these uh, throne-like pews here are original. They date back to the 1390s, each with its misericord, differently carved. This one rather splendidly with a man sticking out his tongue at us. The central figures of this Victorian screen were carved just after the uh, First World War as a war memorial to Mallory's generation. From close up, you can see what Butterfield, the architect of this Victorian screen, was trying to achieve because traces of the colouring of the original screen, which had been covered up for hundreds of years, still survive, as indeed do some of the roll mouldings. So if you look with me, here, you can see how this is Victorian and this is medieval. Or here, at some of the original medieval colouring continued right at the top of that niche there. This beautiful window, probably designed by Herbright of Cologne, an artist in the employ of William of Wickham, was returned to college in the late 1940s. It shows us, in its soft medieval colours, what was lost when the original glass was taken out in the 1820s, first for restoration, then for replacement. Kenneth Clark, who was so horrified by the 1820s glass that he was the lead contributor when, in the late 1940s, it became possible for the college to buy back some of the original glass wrote a very generous cheque and records in his autobiography that he did so and that he'd never written a cheque with a greater sense of emotion. Having seen so many of the medieval buildings of this school, let us now go to the Muniment Room where we will see the foundation charter which begun it all. So we're here in a remarkable room, a strong room, a medieval strong room, known uh, as a muniment room. And it was here that William of Wickham intended for his chests to contain the records of college. And there is a remarkable document here, a foundation charter dating to 1382. Now, my uh, Latin, let alone my medieval Latin, is nowhere near good enough to translate this charter. So let me read a translation here. So that the poor and needy scholars of this kind, present and future, may be able to devote more time and leisure to the study of letters, and by the grace of God become more richly and freely proficient in mastery and knowledge of grammar. 
and so it goes on. While we're here, we should look at the remarkable uh, vaulting of this room at uh, the bishops. That is not a portrait of William of Wickham. Uh, it is a simplified or representative image of a bishop. There, a medieval king, possibly Edward III, representative, at least in part, of Richard II, who was the king who authorised the foundation of Winchester College. And looking down at us, as we walk in through the doorway, St. Michael, who stands uh, as a guardian angel for all those who enter in this room. So we're here on the top of Muniment Tower, where we can get some of the finest views of the college. Over there is St. Catherine's Hill, where for centuries Wickhamists would process up on their free time for badger hunts, to play loosely arranged games of cricket, to collect birds' eggs. And over there is Wolsey Palace, the principal seat of the Bishops of Winchester here in Winchester, a magnificent Baroque structure next to the remains of the original medieval castle. And down there you find the Warden's Gardens, for centuries the private gardens of the Wardens of Winchester College. And here you see the uh, college lavatories, uh, known as a garderobe, uh, significantly enlarged in the 1540s, uh, all offensive matter being swept downstream by that uh, stream we see here, uh, uh, away from the college buildings. But let's now go to the highest point of college, to the top of Chapel Tower, which Mallory free climbed as a student here in the early 1900s. This is one of my favourite hidden spaces in Winchester, Bell Chamber. This bell here, for example, was cast in 1629. This is Mallory's Winchester Summit, the highest point in college. From here you have extensive views over the town to the north and over the countryside to the east and to the south. Down there you can see Meads, once where the fellows of Winchester College kept their cattle, now a playing pitch where cricket is played in the summer. Beyond is the art school, formerly a sanatorium, built in the 1880s with a separate fever wing and two operating theatres. As I sit here, I can imagine the long nights spent by Wickhamists during the Second World War on fire warden duty. It must have been tedious. The length of time they spent here would only have been relieved by the extraordinary beauty of what they were looking at. And down there, you can see the roof of school. There is a clear contrast in styles between the classical design of school, based on the architecture of Sir Christopher Wren, and uh, the medieval architecture we've seen up until this point. In school, much of the teaching at Winchester went on from the 1680s until the early 1870s. The main subject taught here at Winchester until the 19th century was Latin, uh, the gateway language for university study. And from his throne just behind me, the headmaster would lead the school in instruction. It must have been tough going for those who found uh, language study difficult. And uh, the so-called out disque board to my left tells us of the consequences of poor study. So, you either study and become a bishop, indicated by the uh, mitre there, or you leave and join the army, indicated by the sword, the law, indicated by the inkwell, or go into commerce and business, or your third option is to be beaten by that rather frightening looking um, uh, flail 
at the bottom. From here you also get a fine view of the statue of William of Wickham by the famous sculptor Caius Gabriel Sibber. Finally, we look down towards that rather wonderful cloister where we began our journey. Built as a burial ground in the 1390s, as an outdoor classroom when the weather was warm, and as a place for processions for the daily rounds of services that took place in chapel. The delightful Chantry Chapel was built in the 1420s as a place of perpetual prayer for an official of the college, John Frommond, and his wife, Maud. A library was built upstairs and downstairs the chapel where prayers were said for the dead John and Maud. The vaulting of the ceiling is particularly fine, with its bosses showing the coats of arms of leading figures in the country. Here, for example, is Henry VI. Henry visited Winchester on many occasions in the 1440s and founded Eton College based on what he found here, using Winchester as his example. I do hope you've enjoyed the tour and please do look at our website for details about how to come and find us in the future. You might also think about joining the Friends, an organisation that opens up our talks and lectures and concerts to a wider audience. Thank you. <laughs>